Hi Adams, this is Miss K and we are on lesson 12, I think, lesson 12 of our um, geology unit. We're going to talk about mountains today. So we have three vocab words. Sea level is the average height of the ocean surface. So where the ocean is, that is sea level. And that's a noun. Sheer is an adjective. And this has a couple different meanings, but we're going to talk about the meaning that is very steep, so like almost straight up and down. Uh, bulge is a verb, and that is to stick out or swell. All right, so chapter eight is called Earth's Mighty Mountains, and our big question is how do the movements and forces of tectonic plates build mountains? The year was 1953. Mountain climbers Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay stood on the hard-packed snow. They gasped for breath in the thin air. Their faces burned from the bitter cold wind. Despite this, they were grinning from ear to ear. Hillary and Norgay had just made it to the top of Mount Everest. They were the first people to reach Earth's highest point, 29,029 feet above sea level. Mountains are some of Earth's most awe-inspiring features. In 1953, geologists were still searching for answers as to how mountains form. By the 1960s, scientific evidence pointed to plate tectonics as a driving force behind mountain building. As you read in Chapter 2, our planet's rocky exterior isn't one solid piece. It's broken up into a collection of gigantic tectonic plates. Earth's tectonic plates move slowly, but their movement have dramatically changed Earth's features over time. Plate movements have shuffled Earth's continents into different positions. They have destroyed old oceans and created new ones. They have also built mountains and mountain ranges in several different ways. Some of Earth's highest mountain ranges formed as sections of continental crust collided over millions of years. The collision that formed Mount Everest is a good example. Everest is part of the Himalayas, a vast, towering mountain range between India and China. The Himalayas formed when the continents on two tectonic plates met head-on. You can see that happening here. So the plates are going into each other and they hit each other. Can you find India on the map? It lies along the southern edge of Asia. India wasn't always where it is today. Hundreds of millions of years ago, India was an island. It sat out in the middle of the Indo-Australian plate. It was separated from Asia, which sits on the Eurasian plate, by an ancient ocean called the Tethys Sea. The Indo-Australian plate began creeping northward about 200 million years ago. Driven by moving magma in the mantle below, it slowly collided with the Eurasian plate. Where the two plates met, subduction took place. The heavier oceanic crust of the Indo-Australian plate slid under the lighter continental crust of the Eurasian plate. So this is showing that happening. So here's India. Um, as you can see, it moved. It used to be over here. It moved northward. And this is how those mountains were created. As the Indo-Australian plate kept moving northward, India was carried along. It inched closer and closer to Asia. The Tethys Sea began to disappear. India finally collided with Asia around 40 million years ago. India's rocky continental crust pressed directly against Asia's continental crust. As the two land masses continued to be pushed harder and harder together, the continental crust began to crumble. Enormous pressure created by the moving tectonic plate caused the rocky, rocky crust to heave upward. Great masses of rock gradually rose up into a series of enormous folds. The Himalayas were born. More and more rocks were uplifted as the Indo-Australian plate kept moving. The Himalayas rose higher and higher. In fact, they are still rising. They are growing taller at about the same rate that your fingernails grow. Geologists classify the Himalayas as fold mountains. The name refers to the way rocks are pushed up into huge folds by moving tectonic plates. The Alps, Europe's highest mountains, are fold mountains that formed much like the Himalayas. The Appalachians in North America and the Urals in, in Russia also formed through collisions of continental crust. Like many other fold mountains, the Himalayas contain quite a bit of sedimentary rock. Why? In the case of the Himalayas, it started with the Tethys Sea. For millions of years, erosion washed sediments from Asia and the ancient island of India into the Tethys Sea. 
Countless layers of sediments along with remains of ocean animals were deposited on the seafloor. Over time, pressure and heat helped turn these sediments into sedimentary rock. As plate movements slowly brought India and Asia together, some of the seafloor sedimentary rocks were pushed up. Heat and pressure from the colliding plates transformed some of them into metamorphic rocks. Other sedimentary rocks remained relatively unchanged. This is how fossils of ancient ocean animals ended up on top of Mount Everest. Trilobites and crinoids are two of the most common types of fossils on Mount Everest. Trilobites were hard-shelled ocean animals related to modern-day crabs and lobsters. Trilobites lived on the bottom of Earth's ancient oceans, including the Tethys Sea. Crinoids were animals too, but they looked more like plants. Trilobites were the most, and most crinoids became extinct about 250 million years ago. A few type of crinoids still survive far below the Earth's surface. These are the Andes Mountains in Peru, and they are another example of those fold mountains. Along South America's western coast, the oceanic Nazca Plate has been sliding under the South American Plate for millions of years. This has caused massive folds of rock to pile up along the edge of the continent. These folds are now the Andes Mountains, the longest mountain range on land. As we read in Chapter 4, the edge of a subducting plate melts as it descends into Earth's hot mantle. The resulting magma moves up through cracks in the crust. It may erupt on the surface to form volcanoes. The edge of the Nazca plate is melting as it slides beneath the South America plate. Erupting magma has created many volcanoes in the Andes mountain range. Faults and blocks. The longest, highest mountain ranges on land are mostly fold mountains. However, moving tectonic plates build mountains in other ways. Fault block mountains form when gigantic blocks of rock move up and down along the faults. At some faults, such as the San Andreas Fault in California, blocks of rock move horizontally past each other as they slip. At other faults, slips cause blocks of rock on one side of the fault to move up. These slips also cause blocks on the other side of the fault to move down. Repeated slips gradually force these rock blocks higher and lower to create fault block mountain ranges. <clears throat> fault block mountains typically have one steep side and one sloping side. The steep side forms a high sheer cliff. Germany's Harz Mountains are one example of fault block mountains. Others include the Grand Tetons in Wyoming and the Basin and Range Province of Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. And this is showing how those fault mountains are formed. So they're going up and down, sliding against each other, and the rocks are moving in that same direction. So these are the mountains we just talked about that are, um, they are a type of fault block and they are in Wyoming and they're called the Grand Teton Mountains. Very pretty. Under the dome, most people think of sharp, jagged pe peaks when they hear the word mountains. Dome mountains are quite different. Dome mountains look like great humps of rock with rounded tops. They usually occur as isolated mountains on otherwise flat plains. Some dome mountains form when magma pushes upward into the Earth's crust from the mantle. The magma cools into igneous rock before reaching the surface. The huge lump of igneous rock causes the crust above to bulge like a blister on skin. Utah's Navajo Mountain is a good example of a dome mountain that formed this way. And here is the picture of it. You can see it's not sharp. It's got a nice round top to the mountain. Mountains on the Prairie. You can see the Black Hills of Western South Dakota from a long way off. These dome mountains rise up from the surrounding grassy plains as dark hunched shapes. They are the highest mountains east of the Rocky Mountains. Very ancient granite forms the core of the Black Hills. Millions of years of weathering and erosion have exposed this igneous rock in many places. The sculptor Butsan Borglum made one tall granite formation in the Black Hills famous. He carved the faces of four presidents into the rock to create the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. Another sculpture in the Black Hills has also gained attention as the world's largest sculpture in progress. Crazy Horse Memorial honors North American Indian heritage and depicts the face of the Sioux leader Crazy Horse. 
started in 1948 by sculptor Korzak Zilokowski, worked on the massive sculpture, still continues today. So that is the Crazy Horse, and this is Mount Rushmore. All right, so one, how do you think the men feel on page 72? Go back and look. True or false, tectonic plates have dramatically changed Earth's features over time. True or false, plate tectonics can build mountains in different ways. Look at the picture and caption on page 74. Which direction is that Indo-Australian plate moving? Blank mountains are formed when plates, plates collide and push together. What type of rocks are typically found in these mountains? Which is an example of this type of mountain? What type of mountain is shown in the picture below? How are dome mountains formed? What are common features of dome mountains? And we're going to talk about the word steep. So steep means, I'm sorry, sheer means very steep. So the steep side forms a high sheer cliff. Which one of these is an example of something that is very steep? Number 12, what part of speech is that word sheer? And then here are three different meanings for the word sheer. It could mean, like we just said, very steep, almost straight up and down. It can also mean very thin or see-through. So this tissue, for example, if I look through it, it's pretty thin. I can still kind of see through it. Sometimes people wear clothes that are a little bit um, see-through, like a cover-up or something. So that would be sheer, very thin, almost see-through. Um, my cup is sheer. You can see right through it into what's inside. So if you can see through a material, it is sheer. The third meaning is total. So if I am just having the worst day ever, I might say this day is sheer torture. Um, if I'm having the best day ever, I might say this is sheer excitement. So total excitement, total torture. So we're going to give you some sentences using the word sheer, and you're going to pick the correct definition that goes with that sentence. So he told us our idea was an example of sheer brilliance. Which sheer is that using? The curtain was made of sheer material so the sun could still shine through. The satin dress was covered with a layer of sheer lace. I had a very difficult time hiking up the side of the sheer mountain. I couldn't make sense of the riddle. It was sheer nonsense. We were told to stay away from the edge of the island because it had sheer cliffs that were very dangerous. Okay, that's it for reading. Let's go over to skills. So number one, I want you to write and describe what are fold mountains. You can talk about how they're formed, what they look like, or some examples of them. Same thing with fault block mountains. Use these details from the text. Describe them. Same thing with dome mountains. Use the details from the text. Describe them. And for our last skills um, activity today, we're going to do a little bit of descriptive writing. So you're going to read this chart. These are some different objects that are in the rock cycle. And you're going to pick one. Write it on the line, whichever one you want to write about. So if I wanted to pick lava, I would write lava. If I wanted to pick sediments, I would write sediments. Now you're going to give your item a first and last name. So you might want to use the name as a part of it. So for example, if you chose igneous rock, you could say igneous Isaac. If you chose sedimentary rock, you could say sedimentary Sarah. So pick any name you want. It doesn't have to be the same letter. Um, it's up to you, your story. So pick a name for that rock or item, and now we're going to describe it. So what does the surface feel like? What is the texture like? What does it look like? How does it form? So does it form when lava cools? Does it form deep in the earth? How does it form? And then you're going to write two more details that you're going to include in that paragraph. So any extra detail about what your object, what your, um, you give it a name, so it's technically a person, what that person is doing, what they're saying, any other descriptive details you want to add. And then your last sentence is always your conclusion. So write another conclusion statement. Make sure it engages that reader and sums up the paragraph.
All right, that is it for today. Please get on Zoom if you need any help writing your responses, and I will see you all next time. Bye, Adams.